Cravings aren't hunger. They're a desire to, I guess, eat something that's going to derive, give you some pleasure, some value, maybe distract you. Really, ultimately, what you need to do is change your relationship to cravings because, and anybody who's ever had lots of discipline with nutrition understands this. Like, at some point, you could still have the craving, but your relationship to the craving changes where you don't need to impulsively react or act on them. It's getting comfortable with this feeling. Like, we don't have to act on every single feeling that we have, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's ones that we, we've we learned and we've accepted in society, like the, like the violence one. I said, that's normal. That's totally normal. But you don't do it because that's an impulse and I control it and I, I'm okay. I can deal with my anger, right? I have to learn how to deal with it. Cravings and these types of this, these feelings that we connect to hunger, which is not really hunger, it's a craving. We have to get comfortable with that feeling. And some people are so uncomfortable with it that they feel a craving. Like, and they tell you, how do I deal with it? I got to eat what something immediately. What do I do? Yes. Yeah. All right. We're going to give away Maps Symmetry again for free to one of you lucky viewers because it's Maps Symmetry Launch Week. We just launched this brand new program that helps balance out the body, right? Develop the left, the right, bring up weak body parts, give you balance and symmetry using isometrics, unilateral training, and then a five by five barbell phase. It's a lot of fun. So here's how you can get free access. Leave a comment the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to map symmetry. Now, everybody else, this program is on sale during the launch week. It's going to be normal price at 177. Right now it's only $97 plus we're throwing in two free eBooks. You're going to get the muscle building secrets of isometrics and you're going to get the reverse dieting 101 eBook both for free with the $97 sale price of Maps Symmetry. So if you're interested, head over to mapssymmetry.com and use the code SYM50 for that discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Isometrics, believe it or not, this type of training builds strength the fastest and is the type of contraction that will activate the most muscle fibers. Ooh. Yeah. I you, feel like you're just saying that because you're trying to sell a book right now. No. <laughs> no. Well, we do have a good book. We yeah, do. We have an ebook on it, but yeah. you know. Which you're not selling it though. No. You know, put that, okay, uh, aside for a second. Uh, when I did research on isometrics, the first time I read about isometrics was as a kid. There were a lot of studies done on isometrics uh, back in the day. And for some reason, this, st this style of training kind of fell out of favor. Um, but when you look at the studies on isometrics, you find like nothing activates more muscle fibers than isometrics. So isometric would be like pushing against something that doesn't move, right? So I'm pushing against the wall and let's say I'm supported behind me and I'm pushing as hard as I can. My body is calling upon all muscle fibers because the contraction that I'm, uh, the, the movement I'm trying to do isn't working. So it's activating more muscle fibers. And then studies show that the strength gains with isometrics are faster than the strength gains you get with concentric contractions, which would be the raising of the weight or negative uh, or eccentric, which is the lowering of the weight. So it's actually the fastest way to gain strength. Not to mention the, the lowest risk uh, training style you could yes. possibly um, you know, go through because you can let off at any time. It's, it's completely controllable uh, and you're not dependent on the load kind of moving you around and, and adjusting with it. Yeah, that. risk of injury is low and damage to the, to the muscle fibers in the body is low. Now, the one downside is, although the strength gains happen fast and furious, they do plateau very quickly. But this is great information to, to use, right? When you're training, that you can kick off gains very quickly with, uh, you know, well-programmed isometric training. It's just crazy that we don't really do them anymore. What is, do you know what that looks like as far as, how, I mean, I heard you say that before as far as how, how quick the gains come on and then they plateau. Are we talking about within days, weeks, months? Like weeks. We yeah, so yeah, within like four to six weeks, you'll okay. see these really, really rapid uh, strength gains. Well, now, what's interesting to me about that, that's pretty, that's pretty typical for any modality of training. Mm -hmm. so, First four to six weeks, if you're doing uh, five by five training, you strength gains come very quick, and then around you know four weeks or so, yeah. it starts to taper well, off. What you see in the studies is you do see that tapering off, but it, it it doesn't quite slow down as quickly. But the speed of the strength gains with isometrics is crazy. It's yeah. so fast. In fact, there was a study where they had uh ev like everyday regular people untrained do like five minutes of isometrics a few days a week. Now they were untrained, okay? Um, and they, so they didn't exercise. So this was something new, but they gained significant strength and muscle in a very short period of time. Uh, it's a very interesting 
training tool that nobody really uses anymore. It's kind of wild that that it fell out of favor. I think it's because you can't really sell equipment. Well, no, the, actually, the opposite is that there is equipment. There's that what that one machine that everybody talks about that Ben Greenfield's talked That's about. That's a before. new one. That's but, so I mean, there, expensive, though. Too. It, is, it is. I mean, here's the thing, and we've talked about it before. Like that does not replace uh, strength training. Like no. your your typical strength training, and no. the same thing goes with like how we're talking about it right now. Like, okay, it has tremendous value to use as a tool or to complement good programming and training, totally, but not as standalone. But they take the science that comes from what you're talking about right now to support those types of machines. Yeah. That's where that comes from because there are these huge benefits, but they take that and then they yeah. run with you it. Know, that's the they, fitness industry in general. Right. right. They'll, they'll cherry pick some of the, the data for that kind of stuff. But yeah, I just think it, it, it's such a valuable tool, but also it's a tool. It's not something that like is going to remain at that high of value for so long just doing that method alone well isn't that what it's complimentary isn't that what dave asprey was touting when we first talked to him was no his so, was like one max rep with this machine it's, it's a that, mechanized version so it gives you resistance and you're supposed to hold in certain positions but it also gives you a lot of uh resistance on the eccentric portion as well so okay like so it is both a really so. slow grinding um, type of a, a, an exercise, but the whole time you have like maximal effort. Yeah. No, I think the key is with isometric contractions, which is where you're holding a contraction, right? Concentric where you lift, eccentric where you lower. They all have unique values. Understanding them allows you to program them in ways to be complementary. And the, the beauty of isometrics is they don't cause a lot of damage. There's low risk of injury and, and they activate more muscle fibers. Okay, so how is this valuable? Use isometrics on weak body parts or on sticking points in lifts. Like one yeah. of the best ways to get through a sticking point, let's say your squat, you have a tough time at the bottom of the squat and then you get way stronger as you as you lift up. You could get under a bar and have it be anchored so it's not gonna move and drive against it, maintain perfect form in that bottom position and you'll fix that sticking point you know, right away. As far as equipment is concerned, you could do it very simply on your own. You could literally put two, you could bolt to put two bolts on the concrete, you know, some hooks, attach a, a chain to it. And then the, obviously you can make the chain shorter or longer and you could put a bench underneath it, do a bench at different positions. You could deadlift it. You could squat it. You could curl it. You could do a press uh, off of it. And you're basically pushing against an immovable object. And that's the more advanced uh, form of isometrics. But this type of training was used heavily back in the day. This is how a lot of strength athletes and strong men complemented their training. And people think that, you know, the, the strength feats that people did in the 1800s, right? That they just don't compare to the ones we do today. They were remarkable. I mean, Eugene, Eugene Sandow, who who is the that's the statue for the Mr. Olympia is based off Eugene Sandow. You could look it up, and this was confirmed. He did a one arm bent press with 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. One arm bent press, 300 pounds. Do you remember how that's big insane. he was? He wasn't like crazy. 180 pounds. Yeah, as I say, he was not like a big, big dude. No, the strength that they exhibited at their size was insane. Uh, so this is a, such a, a valuable tool. And think about it, like if you have a weak body part, you're probably not able to activate it very well. You're probably not able to activate all the muscle fibers very well or not generate the amount of force that you could so other muscles take over. Isometric contraction at the beginning of the workout gets things activated. Then you move into your workout and it's much more effective. Well, it's interesting how much psychology plays into training and lifting, especially when you're just going through progressive overload and uh, you know what you're capable of. You kind of show up to do uh, your lift and then you test yourself a little bit. But uh, isometrics, I really feel like it stretches uh, your your neuromuscular capacity yeah. to to like way more than anything else you can do, which then opens you up for even more access to all this force production, which if you don't do that, you just kind of like gauge how well you're doing based off of like what I can, what I can put up for the, for that day in terms of like, if I plate load just five more pounds on each side of the bar. Now you guys are talking a lot about maximal performance, uh, you know, from isometrics, but I think where I use it the most was like teaching clients, like getting a client to connect to a muscle, totally. or, you know, yep. like that was like, I think when I think back to all the clients that we train your average, you know, general population, like, they struggled a lot with activating certain muscles. I yes. mean, some people just couldn't flex the back or they couldn't do a bench press and feel it in their chest. And so, you know, putting them in an isometric position and having them push or pull against it while also like touching the muscle or telling them that's where you totally. want them to feel it was a great way to teach them how to connect to that and they could intensify and then risk-free. 
Yeah. I mean, by doing that, like me putting a, you know, 65 year old who's never done a barbell bench press before under a barbell, like the risk of injury with her doing that versus doing like an isometric push up, you know, against something like is way safer. hundred percent. Why I did that in the first phase, uh, restructuring this program for the the students. football students, yeah. right? Because I could walk around and I could see just based off of their form because it's so slowed down and they're just sitting in position and mm -hmm. grinding. You could like, perfect it. You could, yeah, you could just make little alterations, especially in a group setting. It was very helpful for that. Uh, but also it helped them really feel where they're supposed to feel support and, and what kind of action they're supposed to promote. Uh, you know, to to bring their body back into yeah. starting. Position. I like to think of it this way, right? Like, imagine like your your muscle fibers are all these little workers, and when you're lifting a weight, your body's like, "We need ten workers," and then, oh, it's heavier. We need fifteen workers. We need twenty workers. When you're telling your body to push something and it's not moving, and you're pushing max, we need pressure, everybody. Everybody, yeah, yeah. yeah. activate everybody. We're not getting yeah. anywhere. It's yeah. not working. And so now what you've done is you've you've activated all those muscle fibers, and you've sent a muscle building or strength building signal. Then you go and you work out and you do that, you know, your normal workout and you have access to more muscle fibers. What's funny is that bodybuilders, see one of the things about bodybuilding I like so much is they tend to be more experimental with training methods because based off of feel, like I feel this more and this feel, and you'll notice that they do isometrics all the time, either by posing. So posing is an isometric or you'll hear, you'll hear them say, hold the squeeze, hold the squeeze for more definition in the middle of the chest, which is yeah, false, doesn't yeah. work that way, but they would say if you hold the squeeze or hold the peak contraction, yeah, yeah. you'll see more more muscle growth. Well, what they were doing without realizing it was they were utilizing the the val the, the power of isometrics. Yeah. This is speaking of phases. This is the first phase in the new map symmetry program. It's two yep. weeks. It's a short phase because what we're trying to do is get you to activate those muscles so that you can move into the unilateral training. Right. So you got the isometric phase, which is two weeks. Then you move into the meat of the program, which is all your unilateral training. But it, it'll it blow. And already, we're already getting reports because the program is already out. We had the forum. The forum had access to it a week ago. Mm -hmm. And people are already like, oh, my gosh, this feels crazy. Well, so I different. think it, even aside from that, the, I know I was teasing you at the beginning that you're, you're selling a book. But the truth is we're actually giving the book for free for the the launch. But I think this is the first time we've ever done this where we have you know two books that were written that you were giving away with the launch. And yeah. the isometric book by itself has ways for you, even if you weren't running a match. You have an or, incredible model in there, too. <laughs> yeah, nice, you're, you're, uh, your ass, is the ass squeeze in that one? <laughs> is, is. That, is that where the ass squeeze? Dude, I'm, there's I'm a picture immortalized of, <laughs> in, in that book. There's a dude. picture of, of Justin squeezing his glutes for and an Listen, you couldn't see otherwise. So I'm just like, him, I gotta like hey, wedge Sucked him shorts up real yeah, quick. Yeah, it goes, it's like, <laughs> got a nice credit card ready to it's go It's like down. pants, yeah. shorts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shorts. Just gobble them up real quick. Well, we try. What we were gonna do is we were gonna have we were gonna put four quarters in his butt cheeks, have him squeeze out a dollar. We thought that would be too much. Too much. But really, though, what my what I started to say was that you know even if you didn't follow a maps program, that book has the the tools in it for you to take it and apply it to your current workout or replace certain things or how exactly to implement it and use it. Because I I think that's something that we all agree on. It's like one of the most underrated and underused tools that you have today. And I think it's going to make a comeback. It's funny because when, when, you know, when I first became a trainer, big box gyms, huge gyms, 40,000 square foot clubs, whatever, nobody barbell squatted, nobody deadlifted. This is a hundred percent true. Okay. Nobody did. Those exercises fell out of favor and they're so effective. Well, they're back in favor now. Now it's hard to go to a gym without seeing somebody squat or deadlift. I think isometrics are the same. They fell out of favor for some reason. People are going to rediscover the power of isometrics and you're going to start to see them become staples in people's training just like deadlifts and squats and kettlebells and driving sleds now you see that stuff in gyms all over the place yeah anyway speaking of training and working out had such a great time at the oh, nci man. coaching con event every uh, time we, every time we do stuff like this like it always yeah. I, I mean i really i can't wait i'm so excited to get back into doing the live events again you yeah. know we totally missed miss having that. doug and justin there for sure uh, I, I had a bit of fomo i mean it looked like you guys had a great turnout it's a hundred percent so exhausting 
I'm always so exhausted. I mean, I remember I called last night, right? So I get Vicky to push her back an hour. I'm like, I just need to sleep an extra hour tomorrow morning. Like I need it so bad. But it also recharges me for like the next three to six months. Yeah. So it's yeah. like you're exhausted while you're while we're doing it. But then what I what I get now and your feel purpose from, meter goes up. Oh, anyway. it, it it totally does. It man. does because you because you know obviously when we're doing the show you know on on the podcast we're talking out to the you know to the world to the ether or whatever you don't really see the impact necessarily. But when we go to these NCI events, so NCI for people that know is a coaching company and it teaches trainers and coaches uh, how to become very effective uh, with nutrition coaching in particular, but also how to build their businesses. Oh, yeah. Communication so, skills, yeah. building their business, and networking. They, and, they, and they've developed a lot of successful trainers and coaches. And we like them because they're, they're, they're legitimate. They, they're really legit. They've got good information. But these are people actually working with people. So we go there and there's almost 500 coaches. Yeah. And you, you meet some of these people and they're like, your show has really helped me be a better coach. And I'm able to share episodes with my clients. And at one point I asked, because I went up and did a talk and I said, how many people in here became coaches because of Mind Pump? And like, I don't know, almost half the room raised their hand. A lot of people. Wow. And that was really cool because we never, it, we, we never don't tell people that. to become trainers <laughs> and coaches. We say the opposite. <laughs> if, anything, yeah, if anything, we say it's a hard job to make yeah, a lot yeah. of money. It's really tough. You know, it's, uh, you got to really have a passion for it. But uh, lots of people raise their hand said that we influence them to do that. And so what it does for me is it makes me it feel I feel grounded. You know what I mean? It reminds me of why you know we we do what we do. Yeah. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. Met a lot of cool people uh, that were over there. Met some gym owners. Um, even though we tell people not to open a gym, people are like I open a gym because your show. I'm like, are you sure? Because we tell you not to do that. My fa you know what my favorite is is actually is, is I think it's kind of silly, but it, it, I really uh, I really appreciate and and like when I hear from people that you're exactly the same as you are on the show. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, that's I, so weird to it, hear, but it's so true. It right? is, and is, and I think that you know since we started this, what six this seven is all years? All an act for me. So yeah. I guess I'm <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not even his real voice. Yeah, yeah. Justin, show me YouTube your real voice. Is. Hey guys, I'm here. <laughs> but you know what? What, what ends up happening to a lot of these 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 people that follow um, people on social media and podcasts and and all uh, YouTube or whatever like that is that they meet them and then they end up not being this the the character that they have yeah. put out there. I hate that. And I just and we experienced that ourselves with having guests on here that we had followed or known or what like that, and then you see them, you're kind of like, oh man, I thought they were going to be more like this or you know so. I mean, it's a it's a, a huge compliment. I feel like to to be told that like you are who you are, which is well, kind of I, silly, well, that's right? What, it's <laughs> silly, but yeah, no, it's true. I mean, you don't you never know anymore. Well, with yeah, in today's met. time, it is yeah. a big deal. Well, I remember when I went from being a trainer to getting into management of gyms. Back then, the only people that went into management were salespeople, and so I was a trainer and I went into management. And I would, they were like, "Why are you selling so much training? How is this like? What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Well, that's what people need." It's because I was a trainer. I wasn't a sales guy, right? I was a trainer. That's where I came from. Well, we weren't media people. We started the podcast. We're trainers. So we never had any media training. We didn't know that we should be a particular way or whatever. So what you see is kind of what you get. Uh, it's, and it's real, you know, like it or not, I guess. Thank God a lot of people like it. Otherwise, yeah. this wouldn't work. But I can't imagine the torture that someone would feel being something else yeah. and then getting famous for that could you we've imagine? seen it we've seen it oh, they get yeah. anxiety they're on medication stressed out not i mean wealthy and but not enjoying their life yeah. like are we gonna seen maintain it the facade yeah yeah it's stupid yeah. well what what other speakers were there like and what were your favorites you know I what there were the the all the speakers were great. Yeah. In fact, I don't think I... So he had a hell of a lineup. Now, we missed the first day, so we didn't get to hear uh, Ed Milet speak. Which everybody we, said that he was super powerful. Okay. Yeah, Shauna, powerful. Shauna said she speaker. walked into Ed Milet's speech in the middle of it, and she says, I walked in. He was already going, right? So she doesn't even know who really he is, what's going on. And she goes, within like two minutes, I was crying. Wow. Yeah, that's how like power... And then laughing, like he... I mean, so just obviously... And he was like a favorite from a lot of people. Who I really liked, and I I wish I remember his name right now. His handle on Instagram, maybe Doug can pull it up so you can see who he is, is Hard Closer. Hardcore Closer? Hardcore Closer. Is that it? I think that's either Hardcore Closer or Hard Closer. Um, I've seen his Instagram before. In fact, I follow him because he's connected to some other people that we know. Um, and I've been kind of like, ah, oh, whatever about him. I never, I didn't, I haven't really, really followed him. But I loved his talk. Mm -hmm. So authentic. Great story. Hardcore closer. That's, that's it. Is it Ryan Stuman. There it is. Ryan Stuman. So yeah. shout out to Ryan. Like, uh, 
really really enjoyed his his uh talk did not uh didn't think or know him of him really much before this he came across pretty authentic like so he's real. like actionable kind of stuff. Well, both. Like, so he had this no killer bullshit. story. So he's been like in prison, came out, okay. you know, made millions of dollars. Lost it all. Yeah, made lost it, it all, made it again. Um, and then he actually gave like, you know, four very like practical things. Things that actually he was the only person out of everybody that spoke that I took notes, like, oh shit. You didn't that's, take yeah, notes when I was is, up there? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've heard you a lot. Yeah. yeah I, mean, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah, if you know yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did I did because and I came back and he was the one I was telling Doug about. I'm like, hey man, there's a couple things that we're not doing that yeah. he talked about that we absolutely should should yeah. start doing. I did doing. hear Sal Crush though, dude. I'll give you that. I had a good time. Yeah, I, 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 heard I did you do well. You know, I tried to focus on because there was a lot of speakers about like building your business. Because NCI, part of NCI is teaching how to be a good coach. And then a lot of these events are also how to build a business, being a good coach. Because the truth is, uh, if nobody goes into fitness to make a lot of money, and then when you get into fitness and you find you have a passion for it, the struggle then becomes, how do I support myself doing this thing that I love so much? Because it can be challenging. It's not like a, it's not a money-making industry like finances. You know, I have, I have family members that are all in, into investments and, and their yeah. stockbrokers. We like, picked the hardest way to make. Yeah. Well, like, we, and we, if you're like, okay, you make good money. You know? We should be clear though. I mean, so they have two businesses, they have NCI and then they have BCI. So yeah. what we were a part of this weekend was BCI, which is, it's, and it's all side. owned by Jason, right? So, but I mean, BCI is the business coaching Institute. Yeah. Got it. NCI is the nutritional coaching Institute. Yeah. So if you're listening right now and you're somebody who's more interested in the knowledge of like nutrition, yes. coaching, how to apply it good to point. your clients, good like point. gut health, all that stuff. Jason's got tons of stuff on the NCI side, which is that's where you'd want to sign up for courses and stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who's like the scaling the business, making more money like that, but that's the BCI. How do I build an online yeah. you know, coaching So, of course, this something. one is to Sal's point. Yeah. A lot of this was hype around, yeah. you know, getting these people. And so I saw that. And so I said, you know, I'm going to take it back to the roots and I'm going to talk about the, the, the key. Like the root key is to be a great coach. That's it. And what does that look like? And I actually texted uh, Arthur Brooks uh, the day before who, you know, he doesn't realize this, but he kind of mentors me on on a few things. Um, and I say he doesn't realize it because it's not like I asked his permission. I just asked him questions. Yeah. But one of them was like, you know, how should I open this talk? Because he's such an incredible speaker. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, remember that all great coaches or great, I think he said great coaches. Or leaders probably. Or, or lead with love. And I said, that's, that's perfect. That's where I'm going to start. And then I remember the quote from Thomas Aquinas that love is to will the good of the other as other. So it's not a feeling like I feel love for you, but rather just wanting you to do well, mm -hmm. regardless of how it affects me, good or bad. Just, I want you to do well. And really good coaches do that because the truth is you don't always like your clients. You definitely don't always feel love for them, like right. the feeling of it, but a good coach always does want that. You always want them to do well. What I thought was really cool was to see these people like Alex Hormozzi, um, like the Ed Milets. I mean, you had several, you had a couple guys up there have private jets. You have huge motivational speakers, yeah. and to see uh, the applause and stuff that Sal got when he got on there it was fucking cool. It was yeah. really, really, really cool awesome. to see that. I mean, I. I the song choice was different that he chose. I didn't choose it, dude. <laughs> Shut your mouth. Who did that? That was you, huh? Dude. Okay, so I got a text. Like, I think Adam, like, texted me and Doug. And he was just like, okay, I figured it out. Yeah. I got the perfect uh, song for Sal to come out to. <laughs> <laughs> Wrecking balls. So the so the uh, the girl. Like, oh, he's gonna love this. The, I mean, Jason's got all these people that work I mean, for him, right? Cyrus and this, yeah, and the, one of the girls that, that runs like all the the music and stuff. Right, but right before Sal's talk, she came over to me. She says, hey, I, "I just want to make this clear real quick that it's Miley Cyrus Wrecking Ball. That's what he wants to come out to. <laughs> I probably would have done Madonna's like a virgin. I was like, <laughs> yes, yes, that's yeah. exactly what he wants to come down. Make sure it's that. And she's like, Are you sure this isn't some sort of a prank? I said, Well, I chose it for him, but don't worry. She's like, Okay, well, this is on you. So if yeah. this, if he gets upset. <laughs> Oh, I man. thought it was great. You yeah. know what? I'm glad you did that. Oh, I knew you would play with it. I knew you were going to get all upset. You know why? Where's my Rocky? Yeah. <laughs> no, you know why I like that? Because right. I feel like the music that you walk out to, it feels weird it's, to me anyway. It's like pretentious. Yeah, what am I, yeah. fighter? Like, I'm yeah. Out like, yeah. yeah, so you're I'd just rather, going to talk. Yeah, yeah, so I'd rather play. Oh, I can't wait, bro. If you ever do a talk. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh I can't wait. Yeah. Dude, that's some mariachi music or oh, something. God. <laughs> <laughs> or some, or some uh, country, some hardcore oh country. Oh my god, dude! Just, yeah, it was. It, 
okay. It was really, really good. And man, all, all the Gene trainers, Marvel. it's always good. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. so, yes. some, some Britney Spears, because that's your favorite person. Yeah. Yeah. I read she was pregnant, pregnant, by the way. Yeah. Is she really? Yeah. Well? So where were you nine months ago? So I want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam. Yeah. I didn't even know she That weekend you disappeared. I didn't even know she, does she have a, a man or is she dating right now? What's I have the, no idea, bro. I, no? Apparently. I have no, I, I, ask Justin. Justin's all into it. Justin, who's yeah, she dating actually, right now? she's got this new guy. Yeah. He's gorgeous. <laughs> uh, yeah. I Did you see the, the meme that uh, Mind Pump memes made for uh, Justin on the San Fernando thing that we did? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, hilarious. That, that was good. That yeah. is so He's funny. on fire right now. Whoops. So you know, like, oh, I know where that is. I want to say one other thing. So Adam set this up, which, you know, you know Adam, the, the, the relationship maker. So we show up uh, there way before oh, we're supposed yeah, to yeah. be there. And we go to this place called State and Liberty. Which is this exceptional, cool exceptional clothing store for men who have athletic builds, but it's like nice clothes, like suits and, you know, basically stuff you would wear to the boardroom or you would wear to a really nice event, but all designed for athletic builds, all super comfortable. So stretchy. Bro. And bro. We were so fitted. sick. You don't even know. First of all, never. Okay. First of all, this, this, imagine me. I cannot get a suit off the rack. Adam is 10 times worse because he has a really wide, Shoulders you, you are really small. Waist. Buff. You can say it. No, just your <laughs> bones. Never are that pants way. for me. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your your bones are different. No. <laughs> but we took stuff off the rack, and they did they did go to tailor stuff for us just to really give us extra service. But I swear to God, I could have wore off the rack, and it would look better than. Well, we did stuff. buy. We did get some stuff off the rack, but and we didn't buy. They actually comped it, which was super cool. Yeah. You know what? This is <clears throat> the thing I wanted to say about these guys. Well, cool that, for you guys. You know? I, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you guys will get hooked up. They'll hear this commercial fine, and they'll fine. reach out to you guys for for that. Because yeah, like we're, we're not. By the way, there too. there is no affiliation. We're not getting paid. No, we don't work with them. We're not. Yeah, we don't yeah. work with them. This we're not, we're not getting paid at all. It was it was just a really cool. I had a great call with the the founder just last week and he's like an ex NHL player and kind of told me his story and we just hit it off right away like yeah. I, I told him like I said had the call set up and said like because he was kind of like okay what you know how much does this cost advertise what does it look like and I said I don't, I'm not interested in any of that right now like really I'm really just learning about your company I had no idea the size I literally thought there was like a small mom pod yeah, like 17 locations yeah, 17 what? locations they have over 100 employees I was gonna wonder about that because I know it seems like a small demographic but I know a lot of people that struggle with finding something that really fits because you get you know up in size height wise or you it know, is muscular specifically and it's, for fit yeah, people you, it ends it, up like like a blouse bro you know, i like, bought size 33 pants which i can never buy suit pants that are 33 because the legs never fit so i got to get these yeah, quads super, are always a problem and they fit right they fit me well the jacket i could like i said i could have had it off the rack now they went and tailored to make it even more perfect but it's all V tapered and like the shirts are V tapered and perfect. Awesome. What's really dope I know is they now that we went and did that and we're in the system now, all we have to do now is like, hey, I wanted the I want a, this a blue suit or I want that pattern or I want this and like all of our stuff. Then it shows up to your doorstep. So sad. all tailored to you. No, also, we should have brought Justin because if let's see, we just see if he could break the a little test. Yeah, yeah a little quality let's, control. Let's see you find some pants with these <laughs> Good to No, they dude, actually. I've, you know, they shredded quite a few. Yeah, my kids. No, they're, yeah, they're telling me no. one of the one of the things that they they tell people is after they get all like put the suit on, he's like squatting them. He says, drop yeah, all the way yeah, down. drop oh, all the right. way down, squat yeah, them. That's the yeah. test. Yeah, and the girls that were working there kept asking Adam to squat for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Can you squat yeah, some yeah, more? Yeah. See, I did. Did you do that again? How those pants feel? Some love. Here, hand me those pants. No, don't go in there. Just do it right here. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, so. uh more Elon Musk news. Yeah. He's not on the board. What? He turned it down. Why? So you know why, right? I this is the th What's I know the what the theory here? is. I okay. know what the theory is. Yeah. Okay, so you probably heard the same thing. Okay. Why I have an idea of why. So when you're on the board, yeah, you're going to say when you're on the board, you are not allowed to own more than 14, I believe 0.2 or 0.7% of the company. That's a rule. So you think he's going to keep acquiring. Well, now he has no limits. Yeah. Oh, because that's not why I think. Really? Okay. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. So because he's not on the board, he's now can buy as much stock as he wants mm -hmm. and theoretically can go crazy and own 51% of the company. If he was on the board, you're not allowed to own more than, I think it's 14.2%. Okay. So that's the speculation. Okay. So I what I heard, limited. what I heard was the reason why he's not is because they will limit like kind of what he can really tweet about. 
because oh. he's part of the board, the rest of the board will be like, hey, bro, you need to pump your brakes. Oh, so they can say how he does this. Yes. Yeah. And not necessarily say he can't or like that, but they have influence on how much and how he's tweeting. And so him mm. not being on the board gives him kind of the irony block is, to do whatever he the wants. Irony, irony is he has more power not being on the board. Think right. about it. Yeah. Because what are they going to do? They're going to shut him down or mute his his tweets. Yeah. When he, and what's he going to do? He'll pull out his shares and tank the stock. And tank it. Holy cow. Oh, I this just is, love that he's doing this. I it know. just shakes up the board. Oh, you know? I love it. Yeah. I think it's so awesome. No, no. It's I, so one-sided. I was telling you should listen to the you, I was telling Sal cuz him and I, I know listen to the All In podcast consistently and they had a really good uh, portion where they talk about him being on there. And I like it because three of the four guys lean kind of liberal. And to hear them have a conversation around Elon, because I know a lot of like they're all very free speech guys. Yeah, they're good. even though they they lean left, they are very pro free speech, and so they had a really good dialogue around like you know how how he's going to influence that. You and know, how I want to say I want to say something about that. The left used to be the pro speech. Well, no, of course party. they were the ones who pushed it and yeah, started I, it. Listen, I'm the, the I'm, definition of the left has been crazy. I, like the, the difference. I, I I'm old enough to remember when it was the right that wanted to ban rap albums and rock albums, yeah, and they yeah. wanted a speech. They wanted yeah. a silent speech, and it was the left that was always defending it. Yep. All of a sudden, the modern left is the anti-speech party. It's very strange. And, but and these, all identity politics. Only. Yeah, but these guys. I mean, they, look, free speech. You can't if it's you. It's either all free or none, because the second you say no, you can't say this. Then who has the power to determine what you can't say? And then it becomes what's what's popular is okay, what's unpopular is not okay, and free speech specifically exists to ex to protect unpopular speech. That's why it's there. Well, and Jason Calcanis came out and said, well, what about you know when uh, Alex Jones came out and said all these yeah. things and you know I was really surprised to hear the guys like go no 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 you have you can't. Because as soon as you do there, then then there's something one degree to that yep. right. and one degree to that. And that's how we end up where we're at right now, where we're canceling no. people for just some of their no. like basic views. No, it's part crazy. Of the, part of the great American experiment with speech is that shitty speech, the way you combat it is with good speech. Yeah. Not by silence. It outweighs it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And public opinion sways on the better ideas. You have to make your point. Now, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, seeing what happened with Disney, seeing the move with Elon Musk, I mean, I'm getting a little excited right now. I feel like just like three months ago, I was yeah. like really worried, like, where the fuck are we going right now as a country? But it kind of feels like, it kind of feels like we have swung really, really far one way and we're starting to come back. I, I, that's what it seems bringing to be. it back to the middle. Doesn't it feel bit, like right? that? It I, does seem that way. You know where it started? Uh, it started with the comedians. I first noticed yes, it agreed, the comedians. Agreed, yeah. Because they were kind of afraid to say stuff on stage for a second and then Chappelle came out and said uh -uh, I'm going to say what I want and then people tried to take him down but everybody defended him and now comedians are going hard, hard. like bro I watch shows and I have to I am and you guys know I like dark humor and half the time I'm like oh my god I can't believe I know. but I know what they're doing yeah. is they're pushing back so that was like the that right there was the first sign so it definitely looks like it's 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 starting to balance out a little bit speaking of Elon by the way did you hear his speculation about uh maybe having Tesla mine lithium. Uh -uh. Did you hear that? Yeah, actually, yeah, I saw something about that. I mean, isn't it, you can pretty much mine for lithium in a bunch of different locations around the world. Yeah, so the cost of lithium has exploded, obviously, as we need more and more of it for, you know, electronics and stuff. And he says, you know, it would make sense if, if Tesla actually started its own lithium mining uh, side of the business. Boy, would that be in Insane if so you now did it's that. all in house. If they mine their own yeah. lithium, they would be so far. They're already so ahead of all the other car companies <laughs> when it comes to electric cars. And I look, I tell I tell you what, I take back what I said about Tesla stock before. I used to always say how like it's overpriced or whatever. But I know why people put so much money in there is they look forward and it's the leadership. He too, keeps you know? he keeps doing this. You yeah. know, he keeps doing this. It's really interesting. Oh, the dude's brilliant. Dude. I know. L love him, love him or hate him. You can't you can't disrespect that. Ah, it's he's, crazy. He's brilliant. It's he's crazy. absolutely brilliant. Hey, I got a cool uh, study to bring up to you. You guys are dads, so th I think this is interesting for parents. There was a forty five year long study on children, and they identified how like really smart kids, like kids that grow up to become innovators and who are considered you know, on that brilliant side of the scale, like the things that lead to that. And they identified something that made the biggest impact. Hmm. You want to hear what it is? What? Yeah. Okay. So the kids have to start out with some kind of talent. So it's not like you could take, 
lack of a better term, a dumb kid, and then make them <laughs> super, yeah. you know, the super innovative kid. No, there's, a genetic com- the wall. there's a genetic com- component just like there is with bodybuilding. The or guys that are at the, training, at the right? highest level of sports or yeah. bodybuilding have a genetic advantage, and then it's not to take away credit for all the work they did. That's So here's what it is. So they, it's, it's kids who have this propensity or this talent in a particular field, whether it's art or science or math or engineering, and then those kids get that talent fostered and fed. Mm. So, so education systems that identify gifted children and then take those gifted children and then feed the gift and push the gift and foster it and facilitate it tend to do really great. Now, now to me, what's scary about this is all of the, these, these public education places in, uh, throughout the U.S. are starting to eliminate uh, classes like this because they say it's not fair it's not equitable. Let's cut money and, and take. The, we don't need these gifted programs. We're so anymore. concerned what a bad about idea. You know, individuals' feelings versus like the good of us as people. Like that's that's how these brilliant minds are made. And that, they solve that innovate problems. and solve problems yeah. and make life better for millions of people. Versus, oh, I'm worried about the one kid who's going to feel left out because he did. That's such a terrible way to look it's at it. It's just weird, you know. It's like uh, I forgot. You know, universities were eliminating the SATs, but they're bringing them back now because they're like, well, I guess we were better off having these <laughs> these tests. But I know in San Francisco there were two school administrators that got kicked out. They got recalled. And one of the main reasons was they eliminated uh, like AP math or advanced math. Mm -hmm. And a lot of parents were pissed off about that, you know? Yeah, because I mean, the competition to get in schools that, uh, you know, really tough, like it's really um, limited, like who they're going to let in. It's like, you got to be able to do all these extra things to really, um, you know, show what your child's capable of. Yeah. And I remember, I mean, I even, I learned this even as a manager, Adam, you talk about this all the time about when your boss, when your mentors told you this, he said, he said to you, stop worrying about what you're not good at yeah. and focus on what you're good at and become great. As a manager, you know what I would do that with my staff. If I had a trainer that was really, really good at assessments, but sucked at sales, I'm not going to, you know, focus on him trying to do the sales. I'm going to have him teach my staff how to do great assessments. And then I'm going to get my good sales trainer to maybe, you know, help sell deals for them or whatever and, and develop my, my staff that way. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it worked out really, really well. So it's like finding these strengths in you, in these kids and then feeding that rather than always trying to move them away from the strength because they're already good at that. Let's just focus on this yeah, other enough stuff. with this homogenizing everything. Everybody's like equal and no, nobody's equal. Like we all have strengths that are different and that's okay. And we need to, build and develop those and focus on that a bit more. Yeah, know? totally. Now, do you guys see that in your own children? Like, are, and are there things that you guys are already trying to do? I mean, Max is so young. Yeah. So like, I don't have very good examples of that right now. Like the best example I have is like, I remember the first time. He seems to like music a lot. Well, so the first yeah. time yeah. we had, we had a live band in our backyard. The kid literally walked up, picked the sticks up, grabbed them the right way, started hitting them. And I was like, oh my God. And I, and by the way, not long right before that, I was telling Katrina, like, we need to slow down with people buying him stuff. They're spending too much money on him. And then I go run out and buy this freaking drum set. <laughs> and she's, like, calling me out on it. Like, what's up with you yeah. telling everybody else they can't buy him a fucking toy? And then you go out and buy this, you know, serious drum set for him. I said, it's only because I seen him do that. Like, I, I seen him do something. I yeah. saw something in him that I hadn't seen yet. Now, he may play it for a while, never play it, whatever. And maybe that's a little bit of money that I spent that is somewhat wasted. But I'd rather that than ignore those little signs because I didn't get that. As a kid, like yeah. all the sports I played, all the things I was into, they, that happened later in my life. Mm-hmm. When I be, had friends and I started to get introduced to different things and I realized, oh, I have a natural talent here or I like this a lot. And then I would do it on my own where I, I do think what your points out of that study is that, you know, it, it helps when a parent is paying attention and they see these now now I, I have all the sports stuff i would have loved to see my son go do that but i'm not trying to force that down his throat because he's not drawn to it yeah mm-hmm. so i'm also not because he's drawn to music gonna be like ignore that and let's go play ball son it's like hey if he gravitates towards that i'm gonna try and foster that by supporting it anyway and right now the best way i can support him is by getting him well, those things right kids yeah. or adults even you're always like think about things you like to do and you love to do. You're going to be better at it just because you're going to practice. You're going to want to practice. Bro, this is the secret to making a lot of money in, in business. 
is finding the things that you love to do yeah. anyways. I mean, yeah. that that's the truth. It doesn't even feel like work. That's exactly right. If we were, if <laughs> you also have the potential to become great at it because you like, because you're yeah. already kind of yeah. good at it. Cause right? you think about it all day long and you don't feel like it's work when you're, yeah. you know, when you have downtime, you're Google searching, you're watching, you know, episodes and podcasts yep. and reading yep. books and because you love it. And if you're counting all those things, as work hours or time, like you're not going to do it for very yeah, long. Yeah, no, I, you know yeah. what I did is uh, with my, because I obviously my two older kids is now my daughter right now, she's still in um, sixth grade. So she still gets her classes set up for her by the school, but soon she'll be able to pick her classes. So I'll do the same thing with her. But with my older son, he showed a talent for certain things. And what I did is I pushed him to do the more challenging advanced version of those classes. Mm -hmm. And there was a little bit of a, a conversation around it. He's like, well, I know I can get an A in this class and that class is going to look real hard. I said, listen, I'd rather you get a C in this hard class than get an A in this easy class, which is true. I don't care if you get an A, if it's easy, what are you going to learn and grow from? Right. I'd rather you struggle mm -hmm. and push yourself to get the C in something that you might have a talent in like this. Also, like, like how, that's going to set you up for real life in, in real life. You may be talented as a kid. And that may get you so far, but eventually you're going to be around other kids or people that are talented like you are. Yeah. And what's going to separate you is, do you work harder? Can you deal with the struggle? Can you deal with failure? Because, and I'm sure people notice this in high school, like the 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 high school kid who kicks ass in soccer, goes to college, all of a sudden he's like, uh oh, everybody else is good too. And then maybe he does well and then he goes to the pros and he's like, uh oh, everybody's even better. You know, you yeah. got to keep taking yourself to the next level. You know, speaking of your son, Sal, I was going to ask you because we work, we work with a company called Blinksys. And Blinkist. to me, it's like the Blinkus, I always say it there wrong, right? It. <laughs> it's, it's like the, uh, you know, digital audio version of like Cliff Notes when we were, when we were kids. Somewhat. So I was wondering, does he, does, do you know if he knows that or do the students like at school yep. use that tool? Because that's like, it's exactly what that's like, right? You get this yeah. like kind of like. So here's how it works for people who don't know, right? So for they, like book reports, so, you're like, I got right? It. I mean, like I would totally use something like that. Well, so yes, and depending on the class, right? But they, so what they do is they take audiobooks. They have like five thousand titles, so they take the audiobooks and I wrote this down. They condense them into fifteen minute summaries, focusing on key insights. So they'll take a book, they'll condense it into fifteen minutes to really give you the gist of the book. It's seven. It's seven dollars and forty nine cents a month, and again, you get five thousand. And then titles. it also, what I really like about it is, after you go through that, it's recommending other books around the topic yes. and also counter to that. Yeah. So I was actually searching a topic today, which was really cool because I searched it, listened to the book that I wanted to listen to, and then it, it gave me another one. And I actually, I, I got a little fired up because it was like totally what I did not yeah. agree with. Yeah, yeah, but it was like that was good for me because I was like, oh wow, that's interesting. So it gave me the next recommendation was like a counter to the one that I originally. So here's how to. I use it. I go through and I'll because I often do this. I'll look at a book and be like, wow, that looks interesting. And then I'll buy it and I'll read a little bit and be like, ah, uh, not really interested in it. Right. The way I use it is I get topic like you topics. Yeah. I'll I'll get the 15 minute version and then go get the book. And if I really like it, then I'll go get the book and read. I think the whole that's thing. how most people probably use it yeah. is is to just kind of test See, out. See, I'll book. have to try that because Ethan has always been a voracious reader and yeah. he just like consumes like crazy. But these days, it's like there's all this reservation. He wants to hang out with friends. He wants, uh, to, but I'm like trying to challenge him to like his level, and he's always taking it back to like the easy reads and he's, and so I'm always trying to find like new titles that'll be like just a step above what he read the last time. Yeah. So I have to get through that. You know, he's at that age. He's definitely at the age now to be uh, reading like, what's it? A uh, Tuttle twins. Like they, he could have been the, those, that, that company. I think that he might be a little older for that. Right. Aren't they, aren't have they, they reading that? Kids? You know, what would be a good one for him to read is the Peter Schiff one that I told you guys about. Oh yeah. That's a good, that'd yeah. be a good read for him. Yeah. Even yeah. ever. Could, yeah. Yeah, no, my, my older son loves like, he just read fight club. Uh, he nice. read uh, Beowulf, uh, Grendel. And he's like breaking it down for me. And it's like, this is uh, nihilism and this is that. And I'm like, I wish, man, I, <laughs> so wish, cool. I wish I liked to read like that when I was a kid. I yeah. feel like, man, if I would, I would have caught that fire early on, I would have been. You so know what would have made you ahead. like it? What would have made you like it? Because my kids have, they go to good schools. They have good teachers. I had shitty teachers, but I did have a couple good teachers. That made all the difference in the world. Like, imagine you had a good teacher who would discuss a book in class. Well, so my, so my my best teacher was my English teacher, but it was more around writing that she got me. What would have made me really like it would have been 
pushing me to read things that I'm more interested in versus the books totally. that I had to read for school. Totally, yeah. Like when you, what I read right now is is not what you're you would find in school. Mm -hmm. Like I, I do not like novels at all. You still can't get me to read a novel. I will not read read a novel. You didn't even read the romance novel you're on the cover. Yeah, of? I did not. I didn't even read the romance novel that I'm on the really? cover. Really? I have no idea. No, I didn't. You have no idea what your character does. I have does? no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I know. She, I know Based she, off of a true story. I, I know she came you after me because I, I, I the, the description is supposed to be like me. So I think that's really. Part, yeah, yeah. That's why she. That's why she contracted. Mysterious and it. moody. Yeah, you know, <laughs> not my personality. The way I oh, look. Oh, my bad. The way I look. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think I think if I had if I had teachers early on that were encouraging me to read some of these subjects. Totally. Saying, you know, my my best friend's mom used to buy, and I used to read these. She used to get me these cool like entrepreneurial like magazines. Really? Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's great. I, I mean, I don't really count that as reading, but if there was anything that I was reading when I was that age, it was stuff like that that I wow, was into. Wow, that's yeah. great. No, so. I used to read, of course, all the bodybuilding magazines. I used to read this magazine called Omni. I told you guys about that. It's like a sci-fi, mm, weird, yeah. whatever. Popular Science was another I read popular thing. science quite a bit yeah. too. Yeah, I had Cosmo, and no, I'm just kidding. Cosmo, Cosmo. <laughs> that's hilarious. Hey, Justin, I got something for you. Yeah. Just because uh, I love sharing this stuff with you, because I know it keeps you up at night. Okay, so great. California mm. is talking about see. releasing a bunch of genetically modified mosquitoes. Why? No, <laughs> yeah. they, they already do this in the Everglades, didn't they? I don't know if they did it. If they ever really did it, they but did it in they Florida. Released, did they? Did they? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I remember reporting on that because I was freaking out. Um, like yeah. what possible <laughs> horrible so it's the, things, the company is exit uh oxitec and what they're gonna do is they're 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 modifying these mosquitoes and then what they'll do is they'll mate with the females and then the females eggs will die they won't hatch so essentially they're gonna create they're trying to like breed them out they're trying to create population collapse yeah. uh right On mosquitoes yeah that's kind of cool it's well. I mean, that would be great. Like, who cares? I don't. I like mean, and, and, okay. So what? What? Obviously, there's always an unintended consequence. Well, so what else do mosquitoes? Fantastic influence? carriers of disease, right? This yeah. is my concern. Yeah. So they so always. They, it's been tested in a Brazilian neighborhood. It said it reduced the mosquito population by ninety five percent in just thirteen weeks. Wow. In that particular thing, they have some uh, data in the Florida Keys that they haven't published yet. But of course, the fear is how is this going to affect other. You know, animals, insects. What happens downstream if if an animal eats it? Yeah. What if there's a mutation? Like we don't know. You know, some of the stuff. This is what they're so the critics are saying. But hey, I tell you what. Look, um, you guys know me. I'm always skeptical. But if it does indeed deliver, this will be great. You I know mean, how many deaths and illnesses are? are you know what? I was really people? skeptical until we had that great adding. conversation with our friend over at Zbiotic. Like, and made me look at GMO a little bit different. Yeah. I know that like GMO tends to get such a bad rap and a bad name, but there's plenty of like amazing breakthroughs that we're having because of GMO. Totally. So it's not all bad. And honestly, if there, if mosquitoes are not providing anything for our environment or ourselves, and it could limit potentially diseases being spread and the annoyance of these fuckers, getting rid of 95% of well, them sounds like a pretty good idea. It does. Okay, so but, check this out. This my is, cackles are up. This dude. is what's interesting. So they're only releasing males and males are not the ones that bite. So you're not going to get bitten by these GMO mosquitoes. They're also, this is kind of cool, males actually. Don't bite? Check out this. No, the, only the females do. Really? So check this out. They also inserted a fluorescent marker gene into the modified bugs. It produces a protein that makes its mosquitoes glow when exposed to a specific color of light. <laughs> that way the company can track them so they can like look and see like, oh, there's our mosquitoes or whatever. Uh, what? Kind of interesting, right? Very cool. It's very, very interesting. But like I said, there's people who are a little bit like, hmm. Well, hopefully none of the Zika ones fly up from South America and sort of do a little interbreeding. Well, and some people are like- <laughs> You well, know, and so, like other diseases that they might have found their way in there already well, and then they release them. Well, the other thing too is like, you guys, this is the first time you guys have heard about this. Yeah. Residents aren't going to be told. So like, <laughs> you're not going to know that they just released a bunch of GMO mosquitoes around yeah. you. Like- you no. Know, yeah. They just do it. Who decides the city, I guess. Oh, that's interesting. I know. Really interesting. But if it works, I mean, that's great. Nobody likes mosquitoes. No. Uh, now, what animals eat mosquitoes and is it going to hurt those animals? That's what I want to know. Like, are we going to like mean, we're birds frogs? and frogs and spiders? Yeah. Like just, you know, you're running so we'll run of the mill kind of. Wait, we'll get less spiders too? Oh, I know. I'm kind of liking this more like, and more. Yeah, Doug. Spiders are your friend, dude. They they kill all those little shitty bugs. Most of them are, yeah. I don't like the way they look. Bats, birds, fish. Frogs, turtles. What are bats good for? Hmm? Bat guano. I know that. We use that for fertilizer and stuff a lot. Do we use guano for fertilizer? Yeah. 
That's super popular. Really? Yeah. I only remember that's a, that's it from- a, That's clutch for marijuana plants. Really? Yeah, bat guano. So you would buy- bat, I, Yes, bat, bat, bat shit all the time. And I, Where you would use, you buy that? Did it make you, you crazy? You get no. That <laughs> shit's crazy. <laughs> oh, come on, Justin. Come on, guys. Dude. It's right there. I caught it. I caught it. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's at every- um, Lame joke of the day. Hydroponic and and uh, whatever I forget the name of the stores right that are for all the stuff for marijuana plants. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Back I, guano is. I only remember guano from what was that movie uh, with Jim Carrey? It's really high on uh, a nutrient that I ha- pet detective. How, pet detective. how dare I don't know? Sutra. Is it is it magnesium or iron? Maybe Doug can look up what is back guano high in. So he, most plants in in a <laughs> life cycle are deficient in this corn in this weird. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> high in corn. micronutrient and bat guano is very very high in a in a nutrient that wow, that's interesting i had no idea yeah mm. and, and it makes a big difference where do I, they where do they grow the or i guess where they hold the bats for the guano it's american or uh, you have to get it from overseas? you know what I'm, I'm not that much of a nerd like you are probably that would want to know like where did this come from yeah. like who's <laughs> yeah. catching all this poop so what? it's 10 percent nitrogen three Nitri- Three percent phosphorus it's and one percent ni- potassium. Right, mm. which are all the, those are the three Let's macros. Look up, look up, what is it? So those like? are the three macros. That's proteins, carbs, and fats for the marijuana plant. Oh, interesting. So you've heard me talk about that before. Yeah. So those and so it, it has all three. So it's like a per, it would be considered the a perfect meal for the plant. Wow, yeah. mm. that's cool. Yeah, little marijuana science for you guys today. Hey, look, life is too short to suffer from digestive problems. If you want freedom from your food, then experience for yourself. The magic of high quality enzymes. Masszymes is the only company I work with with digestive enzymes, and it helps a lot with my digestion. Go check them out. Head over to mindpumppartners.com, look for buy optimizers, and use the code mindpump10 for 10% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Jupra Cuff How can someone control cravings? I'm trying to get out on a cut but my cravings just destroy me. All right. Mm. So before we get into strategies to reduce cravings, I think it's important to talk about like cravings themselves and talk about how we can deal Where with them. Where do they come from? They're, well, they're, they're also just a part of uh, life, right? Cravings aren't hunger. They're a desire to, I guess, eat something that's going to derive, give you some pleasure, some value, maybe distract you. Really, ultimately, what you need to do is change your relationship to cravings because, and anybody who's ever had lots of discipline with nutrition understands this. Like at some point you could still have the craving, but your relationship to the craving changes where you don't need to impulsively react or act on them. Like I've had clients who are like, yeah. it's so hard for me to eat less calories. I'm hungry. I'm like, well, you're, you're, the hunger is a signal because your body knows you're eating less calories and you're burning and you're burning body fat. So your hunger is going to exist we have to learn how to change our relationship. Well, I to that. think it's funny that uh, some of my clients would be like, "I don't know where it came from. I just had this crazy uh, craving, and I had to just indulge." And um, I think if you step out and you logically assess, like some associations you have or yeah. uh, some tendencies that may uh, tend to kind of repeat themselves. Like if you just are able to really take a look at that and like have an inventory of, okay, when I'm really stressed out or I'm feeling depressed or um, I'm going to the movie theater, or I'm doing like X, Y, Z type things, uh, certain foods want to creep their way in. And then you can kind of look and see what that really is. What yeah. what percentage do you guys think of it is actually psychological and emotional? Oh, I mean, I, I don't know if you can even separate the two, right? I think no, that- I would say that I would combine the two of them in comparison to actual like uh crate hunger oh, hunger uh, like so like, like psycholo- real hunger like psychological and emotional i would i would carve gotcha. off as the same thing gotcha. right w- one in themselves or whatever right so that psychological and emotional kind of the same thing yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you have like actually you're hungry and so your body's one oh. and then you also have like your body will crave nutrients that it's lacking so sure. that's also a sign so how do we how do we know that Dude, the vast majority are cravings very small percentage of people actually need something that they're feel lacking. hungry like like hunger really doesn't kick in until you're out without food for 24 48 hours yeah then you really and most people in modern societies did, haven't gone 48 hours without food most people haven't gone 24 hours without food maybe except for when they were really sick yeah so they're not really feeling hunger they're feeling um you know these cravings, cravings. and it's an impulse you know what it reminds me of it's like you know, when you have a, a kid, you're raising your your son, for example, and he, he gets mad, so he punches the wall or he throws something. What do you have to teach your kid? You don't teach him not to feel anger. 
Yeah. You're going to feel that. Troll that. Yes. Feeling. Yes. It's an impulse. Like you don't react on that particular feeling because that's an impulse. And that's what cravings are. Cravings are an impulse or, or actually the action you take uh, after cravings is the impulse. And so we have to look at impulse control or behavior modifications to deal with it. And part of it's becoming aware, like what you said, Justin, why do I crave this? What am I feeling? I'm bored. Yeah. I'm depressed. I'm sad. Okay, like uh, maybe that's why I want to eat those things. And in order to do that, you have to create space between you and the impulse. This is why I tell people, don't have these foods that you crave in your house. Don't say you can't have them, but don't keep them in the house. That way, when you have the craving, you have to still drive to the store to get it. And at least that gives you the space to become aware and be like, okay, I really don't want that. You know, it's another great strategy that's going to be controversial that I'm going to say. What is it? Do you know? No. You have a guess? Um, Something that we come out and talk shit about early on, especially. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I don't. I can't guess right Having now. Having a cheat day? Six meals a day. Oh, uh, small meals. Okay. I was going to say, know, that, that, strangle you The reason why I think you got the best, like, because we obviously it's been disproven, right? The the science behind it that they used to say stokes the fire and your metabolism, that's all bullshit. No, I see where you're going. If, I you, agree. Eat, if you eat five or 3,000 calories dispersed over six meals versus over three meals, exact same thing. So the, that's all bullshit. Right. But one of the things that I found coaching clients and because there was a period of time where I used to have them break up their meals and it's not always six, it's like four to six, depending on their yeah. size, right? Uh, four to six times a day is because they had all these meals planned out and they had something to eat every two to three hours. They never allowed themselves to get to that place where they were kind of depleted and low and they were like wanting, they were hungry. They were, always, they were eating before they were almost hungry always. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and it, they had good healthy choices lined up. And so it kept them, it kept those cravings at bay, which just made those, those habits and behaviors better. I see tremendous value in that, even though the fitness community shits on no, that. No, you're right. I I could see some value because what it does is it the space between meals is shorter. And when you're dealing with cravings and impulse uh, actions or reactions, it's harder to control my impulses if I know I'm not going to eat for six hours. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I, oh, I got to go six hours while dealing with this craving versus I only have to go another hour and I have another small meal. So I think I can manage that period of time. So I totally see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I mean, I yeah. noticed it in my own behaviors. I noticed that when I, I'm pretty consistent with getting meals every two, three hours, I, it's pretty easy for me to make good choices. Like, oh, it's about time to eat again. I, I should yeah. go eat this versus getting so busy into work and not thinking about eating. And then like six hours go by and yeah, I haven't ate. And now everything sounds good. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. everything sounds good to me. And I'm, oh my God. And I just want calories. And I think it makes the decision that much harder. So even though we know that, you know, four to six small meals a day does nothing for your metabolism, okay, but there are some value in that for somebody who struggles with mm -hmm. this. So if you're somebody who knows that you struggle with cravings and this is a constant battle of wanting these types of foods, here is a, here is a strategy that you can implement that, yes, the way we've communicated it for years is bullshit, yep. but does have some value still. I'm going to be a broken record, but I'm always going to mention hydration and water. That too. Yep. Yeah, mainly because, dude, you know, um, when you're you're properly hydrated and you're also eating a regular meal, like uh, how that limits uh, the overall uh, amount that you really need. Like a lot of times we feel like we need to eat this huge portion mm -hmm. uh, when in fact- You're dehydrated. Yeah, you're just not getting that signal that we're satiated. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's just something like if I can focus on something too, sometimes people need a focus, like even if it's a mouth thing, you know, and just drinking throughout the day does help in terms of like staving that off. Yeah, that was one of my favorite strategies about the gallon of water was yeah. that you just, you keep your mouth, again, not telling a client, Sal actually talked about this in his, in his talk. It was yeah. your talk you brought this up. I did, up. I did. Yeah, about not telling a client that you can't have sodas or drinks with calories or that, but just saying, hey, drink your gallon of water first. And if they're busy doing that all day, like they don't- They're less likely. They're less likely yeah. to even want to indulge Yeah, in now that. I'm going to go in the other direction. So s small meals can definitely help. Now I'm going to go in the other direction, if you really want to challenge, and this isn't ideal for everybody, but for some people, this actually works really well. If you really want to face the your impulsive nature with cravings head on, Yo. an extended an extended fast uh, is actually a, a mm. very effective way of doing this because you know you're not going to eat for 24 hours, or if you go longer, right, 48 hours, right. You know you're not going to eat because you're doing this fast, so you just have to sit with it and deal with it. And then what happens is you actually build confidence. Because, well, I've done it now for six hours. Wow, I've done it for 12 hours. I've done it for a whole day. And then in a short period of time, you change your relationship to those feelings and you actually start to have power over them. Now, the reason why I say it depends on the person, 
I would not recommend this to somebody who has uh, eating disorders or anything like that because no, that could actually make it much worse. I'm talking about the average person who you know overeats or whatever has never had uh, just the strength and the discipline of it. The discipline, the, right? Because no, this think of it just like training. I, yes. th- you're exactly right, and I and th- this is how it would look for me helping someone. The first thing I would do is the four to six meals to get them like to help them with that. Like I'm going to do this so they're not as challenged with yeah. the cravings to assist them so they get some wins. Let's just be consistent. Let's eat all these meals. Now after a few weeks that we've been doing that, I'm going to go, "Okay, now I want you to practice fasting. We're going to we're going to implement a day of fasting and let and the reason why is mm-hmm. I'm going to explain it the way what you just said right now is I want I want to teach you to be comfortable with those feelings. Yes. So first I'm going to assist you so you're not challenged as much and then I'm going to challenge you by not giving you any food and then telling you to learn to be able to sit in those feelings and be comfortable with it because you're not going to starve, you're not going to die, you're not going to lose a bunch of muscle overnight. It's going to be good for you and to learn to do that. So I think both are great strategies. Totally because it is. It's it, you said it right. It's getting comfortable with this feeling, like we don't have to act on every single feeling that we have, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's ones that we we've learned and we've accepted in society, like the like the violence one. I said, do you know how many times in the car while I'm driving, I get the impulse to you know run someone over or or get out my car and throw someone out? You know, you just get pissed off, right? That's normal. That's totally normal. But you don't do it because that's an impulse, and I control it, and I I'm okay. I can deal with my anger, right? I have to learn how to deal with it. Cravings and these types, of this, these feelings that we connect to hunger, which is not really hunger. It's a craving. We have to get comfortable with that feeling. And some people are so uncomfortable with it that they feel a craving. Like, and they tell you, how do I deal with it? I yeah. got to eat what something do I do? immediately. What do I do? Yes. Yeah. So third level of intensity is taking your kid to go get cookies where they bake it fresh and then not getting it. Oh my God. That's <laughs> just torture. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> did you that's, do like, that? that's like black belt. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah, I did that. That sucked. Yeah. That's yeah. tough. Next question is from Nebs. How can I keep my gains while going on vacation for three weeks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so first this, off. This sounds like 25-year-old me, 25 25 me question I right know. here. God, so, we're so hard to get to here. Please, God. I know. So first <laughs> yeah. off, let's address the whole, like, I'm going to lose my gains and all that stuff. So uh, you might lose some strength. You might lose some performance in three weeks. Boy, does it come back quickly. You're, not, you're barely going to miss it. So the week after you go train, you'll gain it back after that week. So whatever you lost in three weeks, you'll get it back. Uh, no problem. So- it's not a big deal. And I want to remind people when you go on vacation, there's the the goal to go on vacation typically is to relax or enjoy other things yeah. or to get outside of your environment. Now, that being said, um, let's say part of your vacation is enjoying exercise. That's sometimes is uh, what I do. I like to work out in hotel gyms and that's part of my vacation. You only need about one, I don't know, the last study I saw was something like one seventh or one ninth the volume to maintain. So literally, if you work out Five days a week, you could do two workouts, and or less, or one. Yeah, and maintain. And, and you're not gonna you're not gonna lose 50 anything. Fifty push-ups before you get to the pool. That's all you <laughs> Come you on, know, guy. You know, actually, you know what has helped me? That is probably I think that one of the, the the most detrimental things about vacation. It's not so much about the working out; it's what happens nutritionally. Mm-hmm. Because the like you said, you only need one seventh the volume. So yeah. literally one or two workouts, or actually, I know you're joking, but even doing some push-ups and squats and some basic totally. stuff is, is Dude, probably this calisthenics is fine. What yeah. kills you is to go from you know eating your protein and take like you're supposed to and a pretty balanced diet to over consuming, drinking alcohol, yeah. and yes, under hitting totally. your protein. That's what kills you and not working out. Yep. So you not work out, you don't stimulate at all. You over consume bad calories or not ideal calories. Okay. And then you also don't hit your protein intake. So that's what's killer. So if if you if I could just give you this piece, it's just hit your protein intake still. So don't it's vacation. If you want to have a drink, enjoy yourself. You want to have a dessert, enjoy your dessert. Just hit but your hit, protein. Hit your protein yeah. intake. And if you get a day or two in there of exercise, you're winning that you're awesome. Yes. Now, is there value in forgetting? I got to watch my diet. Sure. I got to watch my workout. I got to, and just going and just being, and just being in the moment and wherever you're at, hanging out with the people around you. Absolutely. Does that contribute to better health too? Yes. Yes. You don't have to be perfect with your diet and your training to improve your health. Sometimes improving your health means you d- you're not perfect with those things. You're just enjoying the people around you and having a good time. You know, when I was younger and I, I would go on vacation, I would work out because I was afraid of losing my game. Same, same here. Now, if I work out, it's because I enjoy doing it. It's a new place. And if I don't, it's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. And you know what's funny? I, I have way better vacations. And have I lost any gains from it? No. If anything, it often is the break that my body needs anyway. Yeah. I'm more likely to work out just because I'm I enjoy it. It, yeah. it has nothing to do with like 
maintaining gains or, you know, looking a certain way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's again, you got to give yourself a break. And a lot of times your body is craving a break and you don't even realize it until you get back. And you're like, wow, I feel so much stronger, I, more energized. I rarely ever train when we either travel or go vacation. Yeah. Just, you know, I'm not consistent enough. And this is me inconsistent right now. And I'm still consistent enough to be able to go somewhere for two days and not train not or a take a, a week vacation once a year and not train. It is not a big deal mm. whatsoever. And then I, to your point, Sal, I think that that it's not really vacation then for me like I, for me like completely relaxing and that doesn't mean that i like i will intentionally avoid working out if it sounds like a good idea like there are some yeah, so, if it's something fun or yeah whatever. there are certain types of vacations where there's like a nice gym that's right nearby or it's on the the right. premise of where i'm at and it's kind of cool and it's got a steam room and a sauna and i'm like near beach like okay i'll probably lift there because i, I that sounds like a fun well, time for me well we're all planning a, a trip at some point here where we're going to be near a beach like i think it'll be fun one day to wake up and we all go out to the beach and do stuff on the beach like some calisthenics or you know lifting boulders or whatever we can Make find a out pyramid there. just for <laughs> just for a lot of just for fun but yeah you you, you got to change your mentality and, and three weeks is not that long and most people don't take vacations for three weeks most people do a week yeah yeah that's rare so three weeks is even longer and you're not going to miss out. And, it, and and the same fitness fanatic who freaks out over three weeks is probably the person that needs to miss three weeks. Sure, yeah, that's sure. usually the case. Well, listen, hit your protein intake. Don't eat like a complete asshole. If you can get a couple workouts in while you're there, you win. Next question is from The Real Sky Day. What, if any, are the benefits of doing decline bench presses? Yeah, you know what's interesting? This is an exercise that I'm mm. not super fond of yeah. just because I feel like dips, body weight dips are so much better. Way better. Mm -hmm. the, at, at kind of, you know, that that downward pressing motion that you get. More and functional. the range of motion. Yeah. The range of motion you get on a decline bench sucks. Yeah, it's, it's literally it's like like a couple mm -hmm. inches. The, it's so it's, weird. It's, you like, people like it because you can do way Because you can more. go heavy. Yes. Yeah, every every guy I know that does, but you never see a chick doing it, by the way, because they don't give a shit. The guys all do decline bench and they all try and make the case for why it's great. Go do body body weight dips, or if, if body weight dips are too easy for you, load them up. Yeah, load them up. You're gonna get a much greater range of motion. You're gonna get just as much chest activation. Uh, the, now, the decline now, bench. I'll give you an alternative if you like the decline is to do decline dumbbell chest press. And when you bring the dumbbells down, flare the elbows out and come back as far as you can, and you'll get a stretch across across the chest that's actually quite sure. incredible. And then a squeeze at the top. I mean, you the know, barbell gets in the way, so the range of motion. Totally, I definitely agree with that. But and then you're also limited too on how much you can grab and set yourself up for. So it's kind of a pain in the ass. And really, what you're you're doing is you're kind of like you know, emulating what it would be like if you were to do yeah. dips. You know, what I'm saying that the dip bar is now just, what they just say, effective. Now what they say is that oh, decline bench presses works the lower chest, uh, develops the lower chest a little more. And I guess biomechanically, you know, that's somewhat true. I don't necessarily see though why I have I've, I haven't known anybody who needed to focus specifically on developing the lower chest I almost feel like that's yeah. the default part of the chest that lift you know? yeah that's almost like what develops doing a regular bench press the most yeah. it's usually incline and we're talking from just an aesthetic perspective right it's the incline I'll typically focus on uh, with someone it's and so then, interesting because I think back of when I was like in high school and I thought that it was so important because you had your incline bench, you had your flat bench, and you do had all your three. Decline. Oh, yeah. yeah, I would hit all three of those every time I did bench so did workouts. I. So it was like you have to do this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, did the, I did the same thing for many many years, and my chest got much bigger when I didn't give a shit yeah. about that yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah, like you said, real deep dips, and I would do them with the rings and get like full range of motion. Yeah. It was better than anything else yeah. I did. Now I, I I also don't like the way it feels on my head. You, you know, you decline heavy and it feels like your head's going to explode because uh, yeah. the blood is rushing to your head. Yeah, I don't like hanging upside down. No, I yeah. dips. Go dips. Next question is from Rachel J. Fit. When I'm spotting someone doing a dumbbell chest press, should I be spotting at the elbow or wrist? <laughs> this yeah. is actually kind of a funny question. You know why it's funny? I've done, I do both. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, you know why? Because you're a trainer. Yeah. Because you do not spot new clients at the elbow that's yeah. a great no. way for them to drop a dumbbell in the face and by the way yeah, they'll do this yeah it'll <laughs> yeah, collapse they, down yeah. dunk, dunk. so you grab the wrist but if i'm spotting my buddy okay if i'm spotting sal and he's pressing 120 dumbbells it's the elbow yeah now, so, now did you start with the elbow and then go wrist because like i did 
like <laughs> made that mistake and this started happening. I was like, whoa. So yeah, you learned the hard way. Yeah, no, I think I think both are applicable depending on who you're you're using yeah, if for. You're, if you're training someone that's advanced, uh, the elbow because that's yeah. going to give them a better spot. Yeah, they're going to have better range of motion or better control. If you're spotting a you beginner, can also you can assist more from there yes. if for heavy weight. So I actually just go by weight. That's like, true. Yeah. If you're if for you're weight. pressing less than forty pound dumbbells, I'll I can spot you at the wrist all day long because that's mm -hmm. like nothing for me to lift up. But if you're if I'm lifting with a buddy or spotting some like one of you guys who's pressing well, over hundred, it's better for them to bail. You know, if they're doing the heavy weight, and right? Just with like, the elbows. Yeah, have you guys? Elbows. So did you guys make that mistake as early trainers going at the elbows with clients? Like, you know, I don't know if I remember actually. Made, I do. I, think I, I did, did. I mean, I dropped a dumbbell on one of my clients' faces. I've told that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know that was from that was from guiding her on the wrist the right way but then when she was done I pinched with my the fingers weights? the weights oh yeah that pinched. yeah they were only like I almost did that same yeah they thing. were only like five or eight maybe yeah. ten pounds slipped at right most. out yeah and it slipped out of my fingers and pop bounced off of her head so. oh no. ouch luckily no. I had I already re no I, I, I remember I went to spot a client at the elbows <laughs> goose egg right and like what that. they do is you spot at the elbows and they they just they yeah they collapse oh yeah and yeah, the yeah. dumbbell went like this and I let go real fast and grabbed it thankfully yeah yeah and then I just went you know at the wrist but yeah. no the, the proper way to spot Depends on who you're dealing with, how much weight they're lifting. Yeah. And I'm glad that's why I picked this question. No, it was because, a good. Qu it's a it's yeah. a funny one to think about because I I haven't because I know people are gonna be like it's always at the elbow. No, it's no, not. it's definitely not. No, 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 if you're if you're training a newbie client and they're lifting, which they're gonna be lifting lightweight because they're newbie, right? You're yeah. not gonna have a newbie doing 80 pound dumbbells. So if it's a newbie client, I'm at their wrist yeah. to help guide them exactly how I want. If Here's an uncomfortable answer. thing that I know a lot of people don't talk about, but. Manage where your junk is. Uh, when, you, when you're spotting people, you can kneel and do that. You don't need to be hovering over and like <laughs> tapping the back of the head. This happens, you guys. <laughs> That's really Justin. your friends. Those are your friends that are spotting you that way. I got Always you, bro. Getting, like, oh, I got you, bro. <laughs> something's something's <laughs> swiping me. <laughs> Justin, you did Swipe 10 reps no swiping. you're doing five. Why'd yeah. you stop all of a sudden? You know? I hate that. That's hilarious. Yeah. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness or health goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can only find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal.